Well, Congressman, it is uh, just a little bit after 10. It's about uh, three or four minutes after 10. So we're going to start. So uh, we have Congressman Jim Cooper as our guest today. We appreciate everybody being on the call. I know uh, our county clerk, Brenda Wynn, is on. So uh, welcome, Brenda. And uh, we'll let other people, uh, if some other elected folks get on, I'll let you know. Um, so, uh, Congressman, we usually start, I usually just give updated numbers on kind of where we are. We just got them from Davidson County this morning. Uh, 19,374 cases of COVID-19. We had 250 new cases coming into today. 167 people have died. Um, it's just uh, amazing what's what's going on. And um, we'll get into the COVID-19 stuff in, um, in just a minute. But um, anyway, we're glad everybody's on and um, we're looking forward to this conversation. So most everybody knows you. Um, um, at least I certainly hope they do. <laughs> you've, uh, you've been an exceptional congressman for us for so many years. Um, and um, we certainly appreciate all the effort and all the work. Anything interesting that uh, we don't know about you that you want to tell us? Or maybe that you really don't want to tell us at all? <laughs> well, thank you, Jim. I think you and the Metro Council do a great job. And in many ways, you have a harder job than I do because uh, uh, local problems can be tough. And I appreciate the good way y'all have managed the pandemic so far, much better than most Southern cities and most Southern states. I'm really embarrassed for the nation that our country has mishandled the pandemic so poorly. We have the worst statistics of any nation on earth when we should have the best. I think one reason for national success may be that we are a healthcare capital. We have some of the best healthcare on the planet here, but we need to make sure it's more evenly distributed because we still have huge gaps in our own community. But as for something new and interesting about me, I had my first grandbaby about six months ago. As I tell people, it's only a slight exaggeration. He's the best baby since baby Jesus. So he's pretty, <laughs> he's pretty amazing. Uh, his name is Jay. He's actually named after uh, me. And uh, I'm really uh, grateful for that. My daughter and her husband live just a few blocks away. She's a teacher here in Metro Nashville. So I'm really proud of her and especially proud of the most perfect grandchild ever born. Yeah. Well, um, Congressman, I also have a grandchild. Oh, uh, you're not old my, enough. My grandchild, well, I know that. But uh, my grandchild was born four months ago, and wow. um, mine can read and write, and uh, is just <laughs> starting to walk. So, uh, what about yours? Uh, We're working on our second foreign language at this point. <laughs> got it. I, I figured. I figured as much. Well, so Congressman, tell me. Um, let's just talk about um, COVID nineteen. Uh, tell me what's going on in Washington, um, both from the standpoint of. Um, well, let me start with this question, because I got this one yesterday. I wasn't even directed to you, but it was talking about um, this information that's coming from the White House to Nashville saying, you know, we got to get our act together. Um, and, you know, I know um, uh, your brother as mayor is, is obviously working really, really hard to try to deal with all this. And we've got bars closed downtown and now restaurants are closed at 10 o'clock. And I mean, our, our efforts, I mean, we're, we're, we're fighting through this. And I know he's got the mandated mask, but here comes the White House saying, you know, Nashville, get your act together. Can you give us any insight on what's going on with that? I mean, so the question was, what's the disconnect? Well, Jim, you know, we have the most mismanaged White House we've ever had. You know, sometimes Trump is so disconnected from his own administration. You know, it's, it's bizarre. He's been criticized now, not only by his niece and her book, but by uh, John Bolton, you know, uh, and virtually every other cabinet member he's had. He can't keep any help for longer than about six months. And privately, his own people who are closest to him trash him because they beg him to stop tweeting, he won't do it. They beg him to bone up for an interview and he refuses to do it. Once or twice, he'll read from a teleprompter and generally he's much more sensible then. So it's really an unstable environment. And it's really a crisis for America because Trump has taken on himself to befriend our worst enemies around the world and to belittle our allies. So our standing in the world has really, uh, really fallen. But as for COVID, the White House team has been so uh, frightened by Trump's bizarre announcements, you know, putting ultraviolet light inside your body and taking hydrochloroquine and other unproven remedies. 
you've seen their heads just cowed, you know, as they kind of hide from <laughs> his latest wanderings. So um, really not blaming his team. I wish they would stand up to him more. You know, Dr. Fauci has tried on occasion, Dr. Burks less so. CDC has basically lost much of its credibility. It's very sad, FDA has been whipsawed by a lot of conflicting White House demands. So bottom line on COVID, I think is this, our scientists are racing to find a cure. We have some superb scientists here in Nashville. I'm particularly proud of Vanderbilt, but we have, it's an amazing uh, healthcare assemblage we've got here in Nashville. Congress's main role has been to fund these things, to fund testing, to fund research, and most important of all, to fund relief. You know, the CARES Act, which we passed like three, four months ago, is right. the largest single relief bill in US history. And we've already voted for the HEROES Act, which would be even larger. So we had a press conference this last week just to say what was in the CARES Act, and I'd be happy to go into detail on that, but it total for Nashville is on the order of $5 billion just in the last three months. So that's a fantastic amount of money. I'm happy to break it down for you if you want. As far as we know, we're the, sure. one of the first congressional offices in the country to actually try to seek transparency on these numbers, because I want to make sure that every taxpayer dollar and all this taxpayer borrowing, which is essentially what it is, is well spent. Well, so yeah, break it down. Tell us, um, so I'd like to talk about the CARES Act and then also I'd like to talk about the HEROES Act um, uh, because as you know, Metro Nashville has a financial crisis going on. So we're trying to figure out, uh, obviously you know this, um, how did the CARES Act help us? And then if we, and then tell us where the HEROES Act is and then what are the possibilities about passing it? Well, thank you for asking. And first of all, I'm going to list a lot of big numbers and they won't mean anything to most people. What really matters to folks is whether they got their check. And our office has literally helped hundreds and hundreds of Nashvillians, whether it's with their stimulus check or whether it's with their unemployment benefit uh, or with their PPP loans. We've helped with a lot of folks in that area too, but the raw numbers are these. Nashvillians and people in the fifth district, which includes Cheatham and Dixon County, have received about $1.2 billion in the last three months, just from the stimulus checks of $1,200 a month, each adult and $500 for each child. And also from the $600 a week, federal addition to unemployment. And of course, that is $2,400 a month for a single employ unemployed adult. So just right there, you've got $1.2 billion, which is an astonishing outpouring of funds. Now for uh, PPP loans, the, there are about 70 banks that have administered that funding uh, in our area. So it's been hard to track, but it's somewhere between 1.4 billion and $2.6 billion just of PPP loans. And um, in addition to that, there's another $650 million that's gone to uh, organizations in Nashville that includes Metro government, Metro schools, uh, Metro hospitals, uh, and other groups that met, you know, different qualifications for COVID relief. And then there's another pocket of money that's between 200 and $400 million, which is for direct SBA loans. These are called EIDL loans. So the difference between a PPP loan and an EIDL loan, PPP is to protect payroll, to keep people employed. And EIDL is more for working capital because so many businesses and nonprofits have really been hammered because nobody expected this pandemic. The world hasn't faced anything like this since at least 1918. And a lot of people were caught flat footed, but Congress has actually responded in a remarkably quick and unbelievably bipartisan way, at least so far. Now, the big question this week is whether the Senate will continue the relief that we've already voted for in the House. I voted to extend basically all the programs you're talking about through the end of the year, because we're seeing the Sun Belt hammered by this virus. Florida and Texas have some of the worst numbers in the world today. We're worried about Alabama and Georgia. We're worried about them you know, bringing cases over to us, and we have our own problems in Tennessee. So there are a lot of tough issues, and a lot of people are going to be in a world of hurt come next week when that extra $600 benefit well, runs out where there's no the stimulus check. And I know there's a lot of people interested in that, um, the $600 supplement um, per week. Um, what it, tell us what, I know it's supposed to end, um, supposed to end next week, 
So uh, when you say continuation, what is the efforts that are going on with that? And, um, and well, what's the likelihood that maybe something can happen with that? Well, the House voted for the HEROES Act two months ago, and that's even bigger than the CARES Act. It would continue right. these programs through the end of the year. And if the virus continues longer, we'll have to do more than that. But we thought that that was a, a sensible deadline because we're already seeing our schools, for example, struggling with this problem. So the HEROES Act contained like $100 billion just to aid um, local governments. Because what we found was a lot of the aid and the CARES Act that we gave to the state has been very, very slow getting distributed. I've talked with Governor Lee about this. He already has $5 billion that we gave just the state of Tennessee. And I asked him what his timetable was for distributing the money or the transparency on that money. And he's got a committee, you know, working it. But basically, he said he wanted maximum flexibility and he didn't have to spend any of it till the end of the year. And I reminded him that we usually need help right now during the pandemic. And the end of the year, that's not going to help us a whole lot. So he's struggling and, you know, he's new in office. He doesn't really know all the basics. So um, I want Tennessee to succeed. And we need to use this money in the best possible way. So the real issue right now is, so far the bipartisan consensus has broken down. The CARES Act was passed almost unanimously. The HEROES Act should have broad bipartisan support, but so far Republicans have wanted to focus on their own favorite things like payroll tax cuts. They uh, want to include uh, liability protections for businesses or governments that try to rehire people and then they get sick. Those are the issues they seem to care the most about. Mitch McConnell has been particularly negative. He even suggested a few uh, weeks ago that maybe states should go bankrupt. You and I were talking before this meeting started. The headline of the Tennessean today is there's some Tennessee counties that may face bankruptcy, Van Buren County in particular. So the financial stresses are real and we have to address those stresses. It's the appropriate role of government to step in as a safety net for society to keep going because the problem with the Great Depression, the reason it was so bad was government really didn't do enough to step in. It was only World War II that saved us. That revved up the economy. But we waited 10 years. We lost 10 years of growth. And so far, actually, you know, personal bankruptcy filings are down, lower than what you would have thought because people have been supplied with cash and that keeps the economy going. Well, so let me ask you this because there's a question coming in. So, and I've, I've always been interested in this uh, and why we can't ever seem to get away from it. But obviously we're in the middle of a pandemic, you know, we we're trying to hold all this stuff together. And then you have folks and you're talking about, you know, probably both congressmen and senators, they start adding stuff into it instead of just keeping it basic. So this is, you know, um, do people in Washington understand that sometimes it just needs to be a basic bill. We don't need to be throwing other things on it because it just convolutes everything. And I mean, the same thing happens, I know, with state legislatures and even with the council. But in this case, this is our country that we're trying to pull together. And what's the problem? Why can't we seem to get, th why can't we just focus on what we need to do to keep us focused and keep us moving and then just get this stuff passed? What's, what's, what can you tell us as you see is the problem? Well, good for you, Jim. And you're the head of probably one of the largest uh, local legislative bodies in America because our Metro Council is an unusually large one. And you know the tendency that people have for pork barrel spending, it's called. And it turns out that everybody loves the taste of bacon. And, you know, it got so bad in the House of Representatives that we actually banned so-called earmarks a few years ago so that no member is allowed to just, you know, try to add a swimming pool in his district or a a new runway or a new highway interchange because that process got so out of hand. But earmarks are not really banned in the Senate and an individual Senate has a remarkable power to put in programs. Like in the CARES Act, uh, Republicans, in order to get it passed, they put in about $150 billion worth of tax relief for some of the richest people in America and it had absolutely nothing to do with COVID. This money was from the wealthiest benef of venture capitalists in America. And that was a tiny fraction of the overall bill, which was like two and a half trillion, but it was 150 billion that never should have been called for because it had nothing to do with COVID. So, um, you know, human beings are not born pure and angelic. 
we all have to struggle with sin. And um, unfortunately, you see a lot of sin demonstrated sometimes in negotiations. So how do, um, you know, I, I asked this, um, I was just thinking that um, um, we try to maintain transparency in, um, in <clears throat> government work. And I was just sort of chuckling because, you know, as, you, as we were talking about before, the council has been, you know, staying up until all hours of the night passing things. And I always worry about the transparency. But from a standpoint of Washington, as complicated as some of the legislation is that comes out of Washington, how do people know what, what is actually in these things that are coming out so that people actually know that if somebody is throwing these things in there to benefit the wealthiest in a time where, again, the country is trying to deal with um, you know, the serious health issue, how do we, how do we really truly understand what's in some of this stuff so at least we know well everybody should favor transparency and the press conference we had this week was one of the most uh, advanced and transparent efforts going on anywhere in america in fact house leadership has now asked for the spreadsheet that we turned released on the on monday so that they can understand better exactly where the money went because you know sometimes people who've received the money don't want other people to know uh, we found that particularly with some of the larger PPP loans, because some of the organizations that applied perhaps didn't seem needy and um, perhaps didn't deserve the money, but they were good at paperwork and uh, they got the money. Part of our job is to make sure that lawmakers in Washington understand uh, the real needs, because I mentioned Vanderbilt earlier, and Vanderbilt's a famous research institution, but so is Meharry. And Dr. Hildreth is one of the leading researchers on the planet, you know, and you know, sometimes our HBCUs have been overlooked. And, you know, it's kind of amazing because I was proud in this relief package, you know, TSU got more money than Vanderbilt by a considerable margin because there's actually greater need at TSU. And this money wasn't for the institutions themselves. This money was to be passed through to the students. And TSU has more needy students than probably Vanderbilt does. So we try to find equity and fairness uh, sometimes we're better at achieving that than at other times, but that's an example because many of my colleagues don't have any HBCUs in their congressional district. I'm proud to have four, and they're totally outstanding. And we we're just reminded this week with the passing of John Lewis, as I said, you know, one the, the only living saint I've ever met, and it was a great privilege to be his friend and colleague. But he was a proud alumnus of American Baptist, and also a Fisk. You know, so those. You know, throw in, I just mentioned our four, Mary, TSU, uh, Fisk, and American Baptist. We should be so proud of those crown jewels in our community, and yet many Nashvillians aren't even aware they're there. So part of our job is to explain to some of the folks at HHS or the other alphabet soup federal bureaucracies, hey, you know, uh, important work's going on here. In fact, if you want primary care doctors, which America's in dire shortage of, well, Mary is more likely to produce those than Vanderbilt is. So how do you uh, go back to the transparency issue? So you're, you know, um, it's such a weird time. So, you know, when, um, you know, typically on a Saturday morning, um, we would be out uh, as elected officials running around, going places, going to meetings, blah, 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 along with everybody else. Now you're not supposed to do that. And so it's much more difficult. Um, you know, in the past, I would see you out on a Saturday morning. But um, now we're trying to be very careful and not do it. So um, our information is either coming through uh, the news, through newsletters, through social media, whatever. Um, I always thought that this was, um, because we're all kind of stuck, not a bad time to keep pushing transparency and keep pushing this information out. So have you all come up with, in terms of your office, a better way to try to communicate with constituents and try to get this information out to people? Well, you know, Jim, for years, I've done the simplest things, which is hand out my cell phone number. It's right here, right now. You know, 615-714-1719. And it's amazing who calls. Uh, some days I'll get over 100 calls. And most of those calls are from folks who really need help. And our office is there to help those folks. So this is the simplest and one of the most old fashioned of safety nets, but it works because people don't know what number to call. 
I've had a ton of people, by the way, ask me what the number is to get an absentee ballot. And I'm so thankful that our local judge, Alan Hobbs Lyle, ruled that anybody can get an absentee va ballot if you're afraid of COVID. Because the prior ruling had been you have to have a specific letter from a doctor. And people are legitimately afraid of going to the polls. Although when I went to vote in person, uh, they had it incredibly safe. You didn't have to touch a thing. They didn't touch your ID. You know, to touch the screen, yeah. they give you a coffee stir so you can just poke the screen. It's super easy to do. And they're all masked and gloved. It looks like they're in a hospital. It's really beautifully done. But, you know, for folks who are afraid, especially folks who have other health conditions, you should be able to vote absentee. And this week in Washington, there's was a very exciting hearing about that on the Senate side. And the Tennessee Secretary of State was there. And the conclusion of the hearing was the senator from Maine saying that our Secretary of State's testimony was pitiful. And that's a quote because he was defending, you know, keeping people away from the polls and keeping people away from absentee balloting. So there are ways to solve these problems. And generally, Nashville has been a sensible, fair community that's often pioneered solutions to problems like we did in the civil rights era with our nonviolent approach to civil disobedience. Well, tell me, uh, so you're talking about Nashville. Tell me, um, tell everybody who's watching, from the standpoint of what, of what you see in Washington, we were talking about that, you were talking about the airport before when you were traveling. Um, uh, and, and maybe ex exclude the president at this point. But from the standpoint of uh, your colleagues in the Congress, your call, you know, the, the folks you work with in the Senate, um, are, do people understand? I mean, you know, we hear different things about what's going on, but do, do people understand the seriousness of what we're going through right now with, um, with COVID-19? And I know that, you know, there can be other stuff that gets brought into play, but uh, we haven't been through something like this, this since 1918, and, and you and I were not alive back then, so we, we don't know what was going on back then, but uh, in our lifetimes, I don't think we've ever experienced anything like this. So do the congressmen and the senator, do, do they understand what's happening? Do they understand, and I know, and again, Midwest, you know, it took a little while to get there, but is everybody kind of on the same page, or are they just not there? Well, they actually are pretty much on the same page when the cameras are not rolling. Well, when they're afraid that Trump is watching them when they're on TV, then they start acting crazy. Like the president didn't start wearing a mask until July 12th, and now he barely does it. And that was months late. Uh, there are some Republican congressmen who I have seen refuse to wear a mask on the plane, even though Southwest Airlines, for example, now requires you to wear a mask. And, you know, Tennessee is um, not immune from this. Um, we actually have, as a percentage, probably more physicians in our congressional delegation than any other delegation. One third of our members of nine congressmen are, are doctors. But I've seen two or three of those refuse to wear masks. And that doesn't send a good message when you're a physician and you're refusing to mask up. I think the um, compliance is a little bit better now. But I know when uh, a month or so ago, you know, I was wearing my mask. But I think Trump led some of them to think that, well, if you're really macho, if you're really cool, you won't wear a mask. Well, that's just a good way to not only get sick yourself, but spread the disease to other people. The trouble with COVID is so many people are asymptomatic. Yeah. What about DC overall? City, city oh. doing what it's supposed to? I mean, are they wearing masks? You, like you would be shocked in going to DC. All of Capitol Hill is like a ghost town. Normally there are 10 or 20,000 people there. Now basically everything is shut down including most of the cafeteria and the coffee shop. Uh, they're only in each office, one or two people, like maximum. The hallways are completely empty. Everyone you see is wearing a mask and often with gloves. And you can't go on the floor of the house without putting on a mask. Now, again, some of uh, my Republican colleagues will take off the mask once they're on the floor of the house. But that's just acting stupid, I think, because we should follow science. We should follow medical advice. We sh should do what we can to keep this virus from spreading because that hurts business and the opening up of the economy more than anything when you are willfully um, allowing the disease to be spread. I had hoped that we'd have one peak in the spring and that would be it, but now we're seeing a second peak. We don't want a third peak. Um, hospitals only have so much capacity and even though we've upped the testing and the PPE and things like that, the ventilators, uh, we've got to make sure there's enough to help people. But the best way to do it is just avoid the disease entirely. 
Right. So um, I, I, I'm guessing that um, Congress gets briefed every so often, hopefully, by somebody and kind of tells you what we're looking at. Maybe you don't. I don't know. But um, vaccines. Can you give us some idea of, of at least what you've heard in terms of the, um, you know, the short term, long term idea of when we might be able to? I know the testing is going on. I know Vanderbilt's involved. What have you heard? What can you tell us? Vanderbilt and Harry are deeply involved. Um, the good news is really never in human history has a vaccine been worked on harder than this one is being worked on. And there are multiple efforts. We don't know which one is going to end up being the most successful. When we faced the polio crisis back in the 50s, it's my understanding that there were several contenders and it was between Jonas Salk and you know folks like that. But mm -hmm. uh, it's not just the discovery of the vaccine, it's also uh, can you manufacture enough to really serve the entire world? And we don't know yet whether it'll take one shot or two. And we're not even sure yet if anything's going to work. But I'm pretty confident that the smartest scientists in the world are totally focused on this right now. And they're doing everything humanly possible. And the government's throwing money at the problem. The administration just gave $2 billion, billion with a B, to a company that's in 35 years never come up with a successful vaccine. So you look at stuff like that and you think, well, is that a risk that we really should have taken? But we're erring on the side of trying to find a cure because that's the best way to keep everybody alive and to keep the economy uh, going. All right, so let me ask you this. Um, if um, and when they come up with a vaccine, and let's hope it's sooner rather than later, is there discussions now? I mean, have they, are they far enough thinking now I think I heard that they're working on something like this, but are they far enough thinking ahead where they're going like, okay, so we need, um, you know, we need to inoculate the, the 300 plus million people in this country along with the rest of the world. How is this going to be done? And it's not like, you know, everybody just all of a sudden starts lining up for a shot. Um, have they put a, a, a thought into, you know, as they're trying to come up with a vaccine, how they're going to figure out how to inoculate everybody and do this so that there's not, you know, fighting to get in front of the line, but it's smooth and there's a, a process to go through. it. Well, right now, we don't know what approach will turn out to be the best. Um, we don't know whether it'll be injection by a needle or maybe a nose spray. Possibly it could even be a pill. So don't just go ahead and assume it's going to be a vaccination. Remember, we had a pretty sizable anti-vax movement in America, even before COVID, and those were proven cures for childhood diseases. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we don't know whether it'll take one shot or two if shots are required at all. But um, the scientists say you have to get toward herd immunity, which is apparently inoculating or treating 60 to 70% of the population. And then at that point, things begin to get stable, but that's still a mammoth task and it'll take a while. Uh, so the cure, key is to find the best and most affordable cure. Uh, hopefully no one nation will hog that cure because we don't know whether it'll be invented here. I hope it will be, but it could be in England, it could be in China, it could be in another country. But all the scientists are working 24-7 uh, to try to find this. And they're using novel techniques. They're even deliberately infecting healthy people who volunteer just so that you can you know, accelerate the pace of discovery. So um, virtually everything is being tried and it's uh, an exciting opportunity right now. And I'm proud that Nashville has several folks in the lead. Um, so let me ask you, I'm gonna um, go back to some of the questions that people have asked. And um, I've got like a series of about five or six and then just kind of throw them out. Um, so uh, you mentioned, um, you were talking about other countries. Um, and so I had gotten a message the other day that, um, uh, Nashville has a new sister city. We haven't, I don't know if we've signed all the paperwork, but it's in Chengdu, uh, China. Uh, apparently, um, they have now closed down the U.S. Embassy there in retaliation for something that we did. How's our relationships going with other countries? And you would think during a period of time where everybody's kind of in this together that somehow we could all start getting along. But um, tell us a little bit about what's going on in the international scene. Well, the closure of our consulate in Chengdu was in response to Trump's closure of the Chinese consulate in Houston, Texas. Now, there has been a lot of Chinese spying going on. 
and uh, Chinese manipulation of uh, the currency and of international organizations such as WTO that they belong to, and then they try to manipulate to their own purposes. There's also been a lot of needless conflict in the South China Sea over sea lanes and things like that. And probably the worst situation has been the torment of the poor Hong Kong people, because all they want is to keep the freedoms that they had under the British. It was no fun being colonized by the British, but they're terrified, terrified of being run by China and not having any say in their own futures. The thought had been that Hong Kong would be a, a different system entirely. They called it one nation, but two systems. And now the Chinese 25, 30 years early seem to be revoking that promise and coming in with a large amount of force. So um, the British, the English have even offered asylum to Hong Kong people because uh, they're really afraid for their lives and for their future. President Trump's relationship with uh, foreign leaders, all foreign leaders has been at best ambiguous. Remember, we were never even allowed to hear what he told uh, Vladimir Putin privately who seems to be his best friend since he was trying to you know, build Trump Tower Moscow and actually give Vladimir Putin the penthouse apartment. So it's, it's kind of bizarre what's going on behind the scenes and nobody's fully briefed. Read the John Bolton book and you'll get a, as close as you can to an inside picture. So this is genuinely frightening stuff. And in general, as I mentioned, Trump has hugged our worst enemies and uh, dissed our allies. Um, President Xi is head of the arguably the only other nation on earth that has a claim to uh, being a real superpower. And uh, he has been a cruel uh, dictator, the strongest since Mao Zedong. And um, he's got a million Uyghurs in Western China in concentration camps today. Uh, this is unspeakable behavior. But uh, Trump privately, according to John Bolton, actually uh, approved that. Uh, so uh, you don't want messages like that going from our president to the Chinese leader. But that's what's already happened apparently. So that's really what this presidential election is all about. And I hope that we'll get America back um, to its fundamental principles because right now we're wandering far, far away from those. So how does, um, how do you, how does the Congress step up, um, you know, particularly in a, in a time where, um, again, as much as I like to say, we're all in this together and we actually are, but it seems we can't be on the same track. We can't, uh, I mean, to me, this would be a time where we would be, because we're all you know, suffering, that this is the time where leaders do meet, they do work on the peace, peace negotiations, they try to calm things down. It just seems like it's all out of control. So is there something that Congress can do to help make sure that things are kind of on track? Well, the House of Representatives for three and a half years now has been doing everything possible, including cutting off funding to restrain President Trump from his excesses. You know, every once in a while, he's actually trying to do the right thing, but that's unfortunately the exception and not the rule. The Senate, on the other hand, has been aiding and abetting a lot of the Trump uh, craziness. You know, um, it's really uh, sad. And I would like for the Republican Party to reclaim its soul you know, it used to be the party of Abraham Lincoln, but they have wandered far, far from that. And it used to be the party of uh, sensible foreign policy, like Henry Kissinger in his day was controversial. But I wish, you know, for a Kissinger type figure now to come and try to bring some discipline to the Trump administration, because all his top advisors, he's fired. And um, you saw his treatment, for example, of Rex Tillerson, you know, early on, and that's just been followed by uh, Secretary Mattis and um, by other, you know, top folks, oftentimes generals and admirals who just found that Trump was, you know, clueless about the facts of the world. So as, as I say, that's really what the fall election is about. And I hope that Tennesseans will reverse their previous patterns and vote in record numbers because Tennessee has embarrassed itself by voting in unusually low numbers. Part of that has been voter suppression. So we need to do all we can, including to allow continued use of absentee balloting in the fall election, just like we have the ability to do for this August election. But uh, the international situation is fraught. Let me ask you, let me just throw out a question to you. I just, just came up with this one myself. <clears throat> um, I remember the days of Henry Kissinger and, um, uh, you know, George Mitchell, 
and individuals um, that were our secretary of states that you know we um, that we looked at and we knew that they were working and fighting on behalf of our country they were they were you know whether you liked them or not you you felt like they had our best interest hopefully um, you know at heart if you were if if you, Mr. Cooper, were elected president of the United States in November, who's out there? Who would you pick as your secretary of state? Who's out there? And it doesn't matter, you know, at this point, I just want somebody good. It doesn't matter whether the Democrats, Republicans, independents. If you could pick somebody to be secretary of state, who would it be? Well, Jim, I think we make it more complicated than it needs to be. What we need is a president with good old common sense. Like a month ago, it was revealed to the public that Vladimir Putin had been putting a cash bounty on the heads of our soldiers in Afghanistan. And what was our president's reaction? Nothing. Like, that is genuinely disgusting. And now, apparently, he knew about this months before and also did nothing when he was briefed on it. That is unbelievable that a president would not even stand up for our own troops who are being deliberately murdered by Afghans who were paid to conduct the murder by Russians. And this is on the public record. And for our president not to stand up for our own troops, this is a previously unthinkable situation. So that's where we are right now. You don't need a smart secretary of state to figure that one out. You need a president with a heart and a brain. And it, that is something that has pushed even my diehard Republican colleagues over the edge. Now they're still reluctant to criticize him on Fox. This is unbelievable, but there have been many other unbelievable situations. So bottom line is Trump is the worst president we have ever had. And no secretary of state for him can repair the damage because he is so bullheaded and whimsical, impetuous. He's just do what he feels like at the moment. So in a new administration, I think you're gonna see greater stability. Uh, and uh, Joe Biden has tremendous foreign policy experience himself. He was chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, like literally for decades. There are many Democratic folks like Susan Rice, for example, who had extraordinary foreign policy experience. But as soon as you start talking personalities, then you say, well, why didn't you pick so-and-so? Right? But what we need is a president who will stand up for our own troops, because right now we really don't have that. Well, and I, um, I mean, personally, I want, um, just like to know that there are people out there who have our best interest at heart, who are uh, doing what they can to protect the, the, the safety of our country and the safety of our the men and women who are overseas. And um, um, I know that in a country with, with 300 million people plus, that uh, we, have, we have exceptionally talented people that can do this. So um, anyway. Um, let me switch over for a minute. There were some questions that came in about the stock market. And um, you answered it to some extent because of this, uh, you know, the money that's been coming out of Washington, the $5 billion that's come this way, the money that's, that's the, the uh, $600 per week, uh, that money is flowing out so that it keeps the economy moving. And the, the stock market is, you know, it moves around a little bit, but it's still relatively high. It didn't just, you know, obviously collapse. Um, the questions that um, that we were getting on this one beforehand were, you know, why is the market still strong and do you see something changing? Um, and so I think they're asking for your uh, days of looking at the stock market. Um, and we won't hold you to this, but what do you see in terms of the overall economy? You know, can it maintain some strength and what about the market? Well, so far we've avoided a depression, but we're still in a recession. The unemployment numbers that came out this last week were discouraging because they're going back up again. Uh, as Dr. Fauci said, uh, we don't set the timetable. The disease sets the timetable. And I think the resilience of American companies and our economy is amazing. And with government support, we've been able to resist some of the down drafts that have been uh, threatening things. But, um, it's, it's a very uncertain time and nobody's got a crystal ball. Uh, I would encourage people to read the current issue of The Economist magazine. That whole issue is devoted to the new macroeconomic environment that we're in. Because it's not only the US, but the EU just passed the largest aid package in history, nearly a trillion dollars. 
And that's very difficult to get the 26 plus uh, European countries to sing off the same song sheet. We have difficulty sometimes in our own country, but in general, it's been handled better than the Great Depression. But this still is, the, the, the economic dislocations are gonna be severe. I'm thankful that so far the stock market hasn't gone down more. Um, but the fundamentals are, uh, it's, you know, I was talking to a travel agent who's been unemployed now for several months. Is that industry coming back? She doesn't know, I don't know. Uh, where is corporate travel? You know, so many things are being successfully done by Zoom. We could be calling it the Zoom economy going forward. So it's not like meeting with someone in person. It's not nearly as satisfying, but um, we've got to cope with this disease and make sure we come out on top. All right, let me switch over to that, to, to another issue. Um, somebody just raised the question about what's going on in Portland. Um, and I know that uh, you all, um, at least the House of Representatives has have passed some um, reforms dealing with um, um, the police. Um, so tell me a little bit uh, about what you all passed, and then what can you tell us about the situation in Portland if you if you know anything else? I mean, we certainly can see it on the news and the paper, but um, well, you know how how are we trying to pull this thing back together so we can kind of again get back on the right track? It looks like President Trump is trying to provoke um, televised conflict. Uh, the people of Portland should handle that situation. You do not need unmarked secret federal police in there taking people in unmarked cars to uh, unknown locations. Uh, this shouldn't really be happening in America. Um, there are appropriate ways to do this. If it really is a domestic disturbance, you can call out the National Guard, which is usually the local state guard. Uh, there are ways to handle it, but Trump is almost seeking to be uh, extraordinarily provocative. And he almost hopes for, um, um, as say, televised conflict. Um, it's really a sad situation when you have a president who's willing to do almost anything, no matter how divisive, to uh, stir up resentment enough so that his base feels uh, empowered. So this is really a moment of decision for Americans. And I hope that everybody will uh, voice their opinion at the ballot box, because this is not a time to be passive. This is not a time to... Uh, turn off the TV and not pay attention. This is the time to tune in and make a seasoned judgment about what direction the country should be going in. And I'm convinced the president's direction has been wrong for three and a half years. Now he still has a terrific amount of support in Tennessee. He carried the state last election by 70% of the vote. Mm -hmm. So uh, we really got a lot of work to do to persuade our friends and neighbors that this is the wrong track. Tell me, um, go back to the police reform. Um, I know everybody, I mean, everybody's looking at it. We've had a number of bills in Nashville that came through the council. Some of those bills were, were pulled back last time. Um, I think this is kind of a, um, just trying to listen to the discussions, at least locally. There, there are some efforts being made to look at this from a, both a short-term and a long-term effort. You know, sometimes we get in these short-term pushes where people aren't really, um, nobody's sitting down and thinking through all the consequences. You pull back, but you don't let it go. Yeah, that's one of the concerns always is that it becomes more of a short term. This is more of a long term. And um, I'd really, I mean, I'd like to see the council members work with all necessary parties, including the police, to figure out, you know, how do we make things better? But you all in Washington did something recently. Can you tell everybody kind of what you all passed? Well, the House passed overwhelmingly the bill drafted by the Congressional Black Caucus. It's called the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. And this is really just the first step in addressing systemic racism by reforming our police departments. And I mean fundamental reforms, because we do need fundamental reforms. The bill would ban chokeholds nationwide, would ban warrantless searches, would ban qualified immunity for police officers, and would prevent bad officers jumping from one department to another. So, but this is just the beginning because to end systemic racism, you have to do it you know, in so many other areas, housing, transportation, education, healthcare, you name it. And Nashville as a healthcare capital could be doing a better job, uh, particularly in you know, the, uh, certain parts of the community to address the entire community. Uh, so there are opportunities here. Um, and I think you're going to see a massive legislative push because 
this is a very exciting moment in history to have history swing in the right direction because a lot of Americans are relearning a lot of history we should have learned in school. Uh, I personally didn't know about the Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre of the Black Wall Street, you know, 100 years ago. It's unbelievable that anything like that could happen. But many of us have known about lynchings. And, you know, the House has passed tons of bills to end lynching. But the Senate still won't do it. And it's actually our neighboring senator, Rand Paul, up in Kentucky, who is the single solitary senator today who's refusing to allow the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill to pass. He claims he's got technical concerns. Like, give me a break. If we can't call lynching what it is, a crime, a terrible hate crime, then what sort of country are we? But see, that's where we are. And that's a guy from right up the road in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Like, oh my God. So it's really Kentucky's, throw in Mitch McConnell and a lot of our problems are happening up there. I mentioned earlier that Mitch McConnell dared suggest that some of our states should go bankrupt. Well, does he want Kentucky to go bankrupt? Does he want Tennessee to go bankrupt? Give me a break, this is crazy talk. Sensible people shouldn't talk like that, but that's what they've been doing. And uh, we've got to make sure that ideally in this election, Mitch McConnell is replaced by Amy McGrath and get Kentucky back on track because it's hurting the country, it's hurting Tennessee. So let me ask you this, because uh, somebody had also sent in a question about um, uh, AOC, or um, a congressman from New York. Uh, and then she had got into it with a, or somebody got into it with her. I don't know all the details. I just remember seeing something about it on the, the news. And um, how, do you, how do you bring about, bring back the civility that we had years ago? So I, I know that we've gotten into this, uh, you know, into this, uh, it's very difficult for the parties to talk to each other. Uh, maybe, maybe it happens more than we think when the cameras aren't rolling, but um, civility. And I mean, we're all, you know, it's a tough time for all of us. And um, um, how do we, um, how do we work on bringing back those discussions? I mean, I consider you a, you know, you're a, a person that can get along with most everybody. Uh, I mean, I know you have concerns about things, we all do, but how do you bring back that level of civility in Washington? So when people, people actually look, maybe look forward to watching the news and finding out the good things that are going on. I appreciate your balanced approach, Jim. Um, sadly, today, anger is very much in fashion. And I've always been, like super civil, ask anybody in Washington and they usually call me one of the most civil people there. And I think that's very much in the Nashville tradition. Nashville nice. Now I have to count to 10, I have to bite my tongue. I'm probably getting terrible ulcers because the frustrations are huge. But as for this AOC episode, she was doing nothing wrong. She was totally minding her own business. And in front of the press, this uh, large and belligerent congressman from Florida used some of the most derogatory terms that are available in the entire English language to describe her. It's unbelievable. But she um, got uh, response time the next day on the floor. And you should watch, it's on all over uh, the internet, her nine minute response to that. Wow, she did a great job standing up for herself, and more importantly, for all women in America, because too many women have routinely heard expressions like that. These gratuitous, ugly, vicious insults. And men shouldn't just count on being able to get away with that. When the big congressman from Florida insulted her, he was being accompanied by a congressman from Texas. They like laughing about it. Well, this is not okay. It is not okay. And I think you're gonna see, just like with the Me Too movement in general, uh, a new day where history is gonna start swinging in the right direction here. Because I'm proud of my daughter, proud of my wife. I don't want any female in America to be subject to this sort of abuse. And it's been too commonplace. And to see it in front of the press, right off the house floor, it was just a truly shocking episode this week. Well, I, I hope, I hope you're right. I hope we can swing back to this level of civility 
where um, AOC doesn't even have to get on the floor and defend herself. That, um, yeah. you, know, uh, you know, trying to figure out how we, we bring back that level of um, reasonableness and civility and um, uh, Summer Ali's um, editor op-ed piece in the Tennessean a couple of weeks ago in the Sunday paper talking about hate is our, is our enemy and how we, we have to, I mean, we have to stop hate and there is so much of it out at this point. And, uh, mm. I, I don't know. Um, anyway, um, if you can think of an answer for that one, let me know. Oh. Jim, you probably remember when summer was a member of governor Bill Haslam's cabinet. The Williamson County Republican Party took out a full page head in the Nashville, Tennessee, and to denounce her presence in Governor Haslam's cabinet. And here she was, born and raised in Waverly, Tennessee, went to Vanderbilt, was student body president. <laughs> her father is a general in the Tennessee National Guard. What could be more American than that? But the Williamson County, <laughs> the ninth richest county in America, was dumping all of her just because she was helping serve a Republican governor. Like, oh my gosh, what's going on here? But uh, we have to police our own state or watch our own state and our own behavior just like we do in Washington. So um, one of these days we're gonna have Summer on our show. Uh, have you ever heard her um, do her Waverly accent? <laughs> she's, uh, she's, a, uh, <laughs> she's, she's, um, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, it's a lot more country than I am. Uh, I was born in East Tennessee. Um, mm -hmm. um, summer's uh, phenomenal, and um, I think she's great. Um, all right, so we have about five minutes left. Um, here, is, uh, here was the question I was going to ask you at the beginning, and then I just held it at the end. Um, so um, it, it was talking about, uh, and I mentioned it to you before, before we got started, but I was looking at the paper today, and Van Buren County, having trouble, you know, uh, yeah, I think counties can't go bankrupt, but um, the comptroller's office can step in. And I know uh, Deputy Comptroller Jason Mumpower is now on the call. Um, so you've got Van Buren County struggling uh, to make ends meet. You've got other counties in the same situation. I'm flipping to the paper and it's like, I don't even wanna look at this anymore because um, it's, it's all so depressing. Um, and I know every so often the Tennessean will do a, a story that tries to make you feel better about things, but I guess, um, um, what can you tell us? What, what, what's the good stuff that's going on out there? You know, what is with all these other things going on? Um, what can you tell us that makes us feel better that, that makes us feel like, okay, so there is some, there is some good things that we're working on and some good things that are going to happen. Jim, if you I'm can, really, if, if really you can. Of, yeah. I'm really glad you asked that question. Um, America is still the greatest country in the world. We've got tons of problems, but I rarely ever hear anybody thinking about moving to another country. Nashville is a sweet spot in America. So to be about the best city in the best country in the world, that's pretty awesome. And remember, for all of our problems today, and everybody's either sick with COVID or sick of COVID or both, uh, we're, we've survived way tougher times than this. It used to be that no mom would let their kids swim in a pool because they're afraid of getting polio. Uh, you know, Nashville has a sad legacy. We shut down Nashville area swimming pools just because we didn't want them to be integrated. What a pitiful legacy that is. And we've survived terrible wars. We've survived the McCarthy era. We've survived a lot of bad things. And they're really way worse than uh, what we're going through now. But uh, if we're sensible and calm and are neighborly, and actually this home confinement thing, uh, the Home Depots and Lowe's are doing great because people are fixing up houses that need to be probably a, a little home maintenance done a long time ago. Fundamental uh, values of just getting along with your own kin folks. That's important and take care of them of all generations, grandparents, grandkids, um, done right, this can be an opportunity where people can ideally even learn more remotely than they were in a classroom because fewer distractions. But it's hard. And life is what you make it. If somebody hands you a lemon, our job is to make lemonade. And uh, 
if we all pull together, being in the greatest country in the world and probably the sweetest spot in that country, that's pretty awesome. My colleagues are so envious of Nashville. They know we got problems, but <clears throat> some of them are thinking of retiring con from Congress just to move to Nashville. One of them already has moved down here from Wisconsin because guess what? His kids were already here. One's in a band, another's a preacher, and he wanted to be near his kids and he got tired of the cold weather up north. So it gets a little hot down here sometimes. Tennessee is so blessed. And you know, every uh, church, every synagogue, every mosque really encourages you to count your blessings. And I think when times are tough, if you count your blessings, then people have a little bit better heart, better attitude, and will end up being a lot tougher to survive what we're going through. Well, Congressman, on that, I think we're going to end our discussion. I very much appreciate you being on here and taking the time this morning. Um, I want you to stay safe because uh, I know you have to travel quite a bit and um, uh, hang in there and um, keep, um, yes, keep promoting that civility and um, keep letting us know what's going on in Washington and uh, appreciate you uh, trying to get um, uh, working on um, all these different things. Um, uh, for the benefit of Nashville. Let me repeat my number one more time, 615-714-1719. Anybody in the call wants to talk to me direct. Thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you, Congressman. We, um, just to let you know, we're gonna have Jeff Roberts on our call next week. Jeff Roberts, okay. the uh, elections coordinator for Davidson County. Good. So he can kind of let us know what's happening with all that. And um, uh, everybody um, stay safe. Uh, have a wonderful weekend and a, a, a good next week. And hopefully we'll see everybody uh, next week. Thanks, Appreciate everybody. It. Appreciate Thank everybody you. being on the call.